everybody. Sean Sewell with Engagement.com podcast. Got a really exciting episode today. We get to talk to the CEO and founder of Outdoor Vitals, which has been one of my favorite new companies to me, at least in our audience the last year and a half or so, is Tayson Whitaker. Tayson, welcome to Engagement Podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to be here with you, Sean. Also be a lot of fun. And Tayson also hosts his own podcast, the Live Ultralight Podcast, which is you can find on podcast formats as well as on YouTube. Really cool interviews. And not only that, but uh, before we were recording, Tayson and I were, were uh, joking about up in the quality, getting better microphones. We both have sure microphones here and uh, additional like Sony cameras and just really wanted to present uh, as best content as possible, audio and video wise for our interviews and just for general, it just feels good to to put forth the effort and do as best as possible. Yeah, so, it's 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 always nice to be able to put together a, a quality piece, and that's something you've done a great job with over here, Sean. Oh, I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's been fun to evolve. Um, well, with your content, what was your first camera or first audio setup? In the- <laughs> exactly, um, my cell phone. I mean, to be to be mm-hmm. totally honest, if you go back to the archives of, of Outdoor Vitals. Um, I mean, well, first off, you wouldn't recognize the company, but just from the very beginning, I always had this, this vision that we could create a company that felt like a mom and pop store, but we were able to operate um, like a bigger corporation on the backside so that we could create you know, the products and the opportunities we wanted to for our customers. And so right after getting started, I started filming, um, just in, in this little duplex we were living in. And I'm literally sitting behind like a, a coffee table. I'm sitting on a five gallon bucket that you can't see. And my window, you know, drapes are the background and just started filming content, just how to take care of your down sleeping bag was, was really the first set of videos that I did. And so it's gone from, you know, old generation, 2014, you know, cell phones, and just gone forward from there. So, you know, went into, you know, we've, we've had Sony cameras, we've had GoPros, we've had the the 360 cameras, which, which are a lot of fun now. Those are, And fun. then, and then now this, this Sony a seven. So. Oh, that's a fun evolution. And I totally respect that. Um, one of our first interviews we did was with Patagonia and we snuck into uh, at that time, SIA, it was like before, it integrated with outdoor retailer and we snuck in with a catering company and we had only our cell phones and we got the very first meeting with Patagonia, like 8 AM when it doesn't really open until like nine. And we shot it with our, our cell phones, got it uploaded at lunch and it worked, you know, and we've evolved <laughs> like you have. And it, it, the, just the honest hustle of it all is just, it's fun to see. Uh, that next day we, we interviewed Cody Town, uh, Townsend for ski line of the year. Everybody had these big cameras and we came with our little GoPro on a stick and, uh, you know, got the job done. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to be said about just, I mean, one, just creating anything is more important than not creating, mm-hmm. but, but two, I think, um, you know, there's a lot you can do just with, with lighting and knowing how to use the camera. I see guys that film stuff on, on GoPros and I'm like, man, what camera are you using here? And, and they tell me, and it's like, man, like they're getting the most out of the equipment they have. Absolutely. And I'm excited that you guys are using the 360 cameras. We've worked with uh, GoPro. They have a new one coming out. I can't say much more than that. Uh, but also Insta360, uh, their camera, mm-hmm. the X3 is what I currently use. I've been using the, since the very first one that they re- released to the consumer level. And it's such a fun, creative tool in your pocket. And I love it because we have four nieces under age nine. When I shoot footage, I can always get all of them in the frame. I can reframe yeah. it however I want to see it, and especially if you have kids and stuff like that and you want to make sure you get the footage of them. It's a good tool. So. We took that 360 camera, the Insta360, I think it's the RS. Um, mm. And I was just commenting on how good the quality of the footage was. And just um, essentially that I, I commented to our videographer and just said, I think this is the, the best trip we've ever captured. Like we just got so much footage. It was the best quality footage. And I think the, that that Insta360 was really the difference because you can set it and run it. And it doesn't take much battery. You can pop a big old SD card in there. And so we get conversations and we get facial expressions that we normally don't get because you're just, you just let it sit there and run for, you know, 20 minutes at a time here and 20 minutes at a time there. And, um, we, we have a video that will be coming out from the, you went to Highline trip that we did last summer, where we even had to have a conversation where we had to send someone off the trail. They just weren't keeping up and it was starting to, um, affect what everyone else was trying to do on the trip and, and the timeline there. And, you know, we're able to, to run that camera during that kind of a conversation 
and it not be in your face and not be, I mean, I don't even think half the group knew that we were recording anything at that point in time, but you're still getting, you know, their facial expressions and the audio. And so they're fun. They're, they're a lot of fun. I think they add a lot to, to the tool bag. Oh, for sure. I'm glad to hear you guys are embracing them too. And it takes a place of a, you know, a full on camera on a gimbal too. Like you don't have to carry this kind of thing around, right? Which is not easy to carry around, but you carry around the Insta360 and it's gimbal like, and you can get some really great shots. And then also like you, you get the genuine behind the scenes, not staged kind of stuff. It's a good yeah. tool. Very good tool. Yeah. And it's fun, it's for fun. and also for like fishing. And in my case, I uh, split boarding at the one of the split boards right there. It's the best for that because you get the GoPro, GoPro kind of angle, but then you can give a point of view. You can change a point of view. Yeah. I, I should be selling these right now. <laughs> well, I'm sure you are. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we will. We will for sure. Well, this is exciting. Um, I love the the creative aspects and seeing the evolution going from our cell phones to uh, Sony cameras um, and better microphones uh, and making it all just more presentable. Um, what does it look like for you for creating content? Do you, do you batch it? Do you have like a, a, a workflow that you do like every day or once per trip kind of thing? Yeah. You know, it's been an ongoing process for so many years and it's changed um, so much over the years, but at this point it's getting harder and harder, right? The team size is getting bigger, the tasks and things that come onto my plate, you know, are, are, are so much. And so we do the best we can to just streamline things. So Joe, um, our videographer and, and director of content, essentially, he, he, he does a great job of making my job easier, right? Like having everything set up, I can plug in and, and whatnot, but, but we do batch at this point, a lot of our videos, are just filmed on trail. So once a month at Outdoor Vitals, we do a team wide open invite. Anyone can come on a backpacking trip with us and we'll, you know, we'll pay for it. You know, it's it's time on the clock essentially. And on those trips, though, we are trying to capture as much as we can, whether that's, you know, the different times of con types of content. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's guys like you doing such a good job now, and, and there's a lot of guys out there teaching the tips and tricks and that side of things that we've honestly pulled back a little bit on some of those areas that we've we've done before, and we've we're shooting a lot more full film style, documentary style um type of videos, and so those are obviously just on trail, and so um, yeah, it's been all over the board. I wish that I could say like, I just batched it on Fridays only. I did this kind of stuff, but it's really not that way. It's just, just trying to be as, as optimal as possible, but it's a lot of time and it's a lot of work. I mean, you can, you can tell why maybe other companies out there don't do it is it's, it, there's nothing easy about creating. Right. So yeah, it's, it just it, takes time. It does take time, especially when you do it at the level you guys are doing. It's fun because not a lot of other gear companies are putting forth the effort to do anything besides this is our jacket and how it looks on a mannequin in the studio, as opposed to like an adventure, uh, like most recently, uh, Australian Alps, ultralight back, packing gear loadout, nine days, 12 pounds. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> Like, yeah. I'm yeah. So like we're, we're going to put, yeah, we're going to put stuff like that together as much as we can. Um, Cause like, just kind of like you said, like you can, you know, you can go out, so you can outsource stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, you could outsource, you could pay a, a sponsored athlete to, to, to do some of this stuff and you could have a media team. And, but we're just, I think for us, it just makes a big deal of difference to be just more transparent and have it coming from us, I guess. And so there is, you know, faces behind the company and, and, um, yeah, I mean it it's a commitment, but it's it's kind of this long-term goal that we have to in in what we envision the company to be, I guess. And and it really just comes back to kind of that transparency side of things. Um, but you know, I mean a big goal for us is is to get people outside, right? Our our purpose is mm -hmm. is to connect people to the vital outdoors. And as much as I want to say, yeah, let me just sell as many widgets as I can, that helps you. Um, you know, I could take you, Sean, into Walmart and you could easily pick out Walmart gear and have an amazing experience in the outdoors because of the knowledge that you have. And so to us, it's not just one or the other, it's both. And so we do a lot of educating and trying to inspire and, and, you know, reduce the amount of fear people have or apprehension they have by education and by, you know, the experiences that we're taking them on. So that's fantastic. And I think that that's a really good mission statement about, uh, Educate and empower to explore the outdoor, the vital outdoors. That's, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it's about for us is I feel like 
and and everyone here on the team feels like we're getting into this day and age where there's so much technology. I mean, just in the last 10 years, like, or, or 12 years since the introduction of a smartphone, like the, the level of, of change in, from a social perspective, right. Whether that's, you know, just mental health, emotional health, mm -hmm. um, or anything that that's connected or touching that it, it's, it's sliding and it's sliding fast. And to us, you know, that the yin to the yang to that right there is, is to get more time outside, to get fully disconnected, you know, to connect with, with nature. Um, and a lot of people that are religious that that can be a connection to, to a higher power or something as well, but really it's just getting that opportunity to fully disconnect and reconnect with yourself and nature. hundred percent support, support that for sure. Um, I, I also run a gym out here in Denver and we, um, our goal is to get every member of the gym out on, on the trail, hiking, biking, skiing, snowboarding on a horse, on a, on whatever, on a paddleboard, just outside. It's, it is integral to the community, uh, training and the outdoors. It's just for the mental health, the physical health. I wish more people would embrace that and get the heck off their phones and just go out there and look at the tree in the front yard. It doesn't take much. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, I just had, a, we might be getting off subject here, but I was just talking to one of some of my family members over the weekend where I was like, you know, sometimes like you get in this rat race in the sense of like, okay, like I got to work, I got to make more money so that I can, I can buy set like a cabin, let's say, and then I can sit on the porch of the cabin and I could do nothing. Right. And it's like this whole, the whole conundrum of, well, I could do that right now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I could, if I slowed my life down, I could do that right now. And, and it's, it, it does, it just happens so often. And I was, I was thinking about even just my old, my old grandmother. I feel like every time we'd pop over to her house, she'd be sitting on her back porch, just in this little lounge chair and just watching the birds in her backyard. And I'm like, man, there is something to that, that, that we don't have anymore that, that I'd, yeah. I'd love to get back to. Oh, hundred percent. I'm with you. I'm, I'm fortunate that we have a deck. I get on the deck and that's my decompression zone and just stare. I don't have to go anywhere. Just stare at the trees. Oh, I love awesome. it. I love that you're embracing the mental health aspect of it too. Um, if we can rewind quite a bit, what was the creation story? What was a why of creating outdoor vitals? It was just that. I mean, as a kid, I grew up in the outdoors. I grew up in this small town of about 6,000 people. Um, I thought I was from the big city because everyone around us is even smaller farming communities. So I remember when I left that town, people would call me like, oh, you're a hick, you know, you're a farmer or something. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? I'm from the big city. Like those guys <laughs> are the hicks. But no, I spent a lot of time outside you know, grew up in Boy Scouts, grew up with a family that was just always out. And so I spent a lot of nights outdoors, not necessarily backpacking, but just outside. And it was always with whatever gear we could, we could muster up, you know, it was yard cell sleeping bags. It was, it was Walmart, you know, whatever we could find there. It was trash bags when it rained. Um, and so when I got older and I started making my own purchasing decisions, you know, in college, I picked up a few quality pieces of gear and it was like, they changed my life. I was like, Oh my goodness, this is what people have had. This is what it can be. And it just made me realize that if more people had quality gear and what I later discovered too, is, you know, the knowledge to go with it, um, it would change their entire experience outdoors and it would get them outdoors into something that I believed was, was a critical part of, of what we need. Um, and so that was really the the purpose behind it was, Hey, if we can get them into quality gear if, and, and do so as a direct to consumer. So in the beginning too, that was a huge part of why we did it direct to consumers so that we didn't have to pay, you know, retail markups of 40, 50% and add that onto the price of the gear. Um, and so by doing that, by doing it online, you know, we were able to, to, to basically get this higher quality um, tier of product into people's hands and hopefully change their experience. Because the biggest thing that, that, that kills me is when I have those conversations, I know you've had, because you're an outdoors person and you always hear it, it'll come up when they hear how much time you spend outside or sleeping outside. And they'll say, Oh, I slept outside once I froze my butt off and I'll never go back outside. Like I've never camped in the last 30 years, ever since I did that. And it kills you. Cause you're just like, that's a lifetime of opportunity it's a lifetime of life changing experiences that you've missed out on because of this one bad experience, because of maybe bad gear or because of bad yeah. knowledge. And so that, that really was the foundation of me starting it. Um, you know, and, and then from there it was, it was just true bootstrapping. Um, you know, a lot of everyone it, starting a business is such a, a sexy thing nowadays, right? It's like, <laughs> Oh, you go out there, you start a business, you get rich and all, and, you know, and it's, you raise venture capital and you know, you're, you're just balling. Right. And that was never, 
you know, our story, our story was, we don't want to touch venture capital that changes our decisions that changes how we do things that changes us from looking at what we could build in 10 years to what we could build next quarter. Right. And so, um, it was very much just line upon line. I actually, I hate to even go back this far, but like, I mean, I was, I was ordering samples out of factories, um, and selling those to, to gain viability of if this was a business or not that I could, I could pursue and, and, and make, make it work. Right. And so then from there it was, okay, let's see if we can run a small batch of something you're already running and take the logo off. I mean, it was that, that level. Uh, but thankfully, you know, we, we, I was able to do that long enough and, and, and bootstrap it long enough that we got to the point where in 2018, we released the loft tech jacket. And that was actually released on Kickstarter, yeah. which is like a, a pre-sell platform. And we pre-sold between that and Indiegogo a million dollars worth of that jacket. Wow. Um, so before we'd ever shipped it, we'd already sold a million dollars of this jacket. And that was really the opportunity and the, and the turning point that I was able to jump on and create what I always wanted to build, which is what it is today. And so we, you know, we took that opportunity to go and leverage and get into some of the most premium fabric and cut and sew facilities in the world. And we took that opportunity to go and hire a full-time designer because I was designing all the gear at that point um, and, and just build the team in, in, in all those ways that are, that are critical. And so then from about 2019 on, it was okay, redesigning old gear. It was creating new gear. And then about 2020 till now it's, people have actually been able to see and get their hands on, on this quality of product that, that we're producing now. So that's it in a nutshell, really, I'd love to say our, our story started in 2018, but it was, it was a true bootstrap before that. So I like that it was a bootstrap and you didn't take any funny from anybody else. Like you mentioned, uh, so you're not inclined to, uh, appease them and do it the way you want to do it, which I think is just the best way to go about it. Um, and I love how you're taking um, the things and just re-evolving them. And one of the questions I want to bring up is how do you even design the gear? Is it out of necessity? So you're backpacking like, oh man, I really wish that the pocket was a little bit higher or a little bit lower or the chin guard was higher. Let's see if we can create that. Or do we, do you see other things in other companies like, oh, that's a good idea for the hood, the semi-stiffened and incorporate that as well. I would say all of our best ideas, best innovations have come from trail time, yeah. right? Um, like, like I mentioned, we go out on trail as a team at least once a month. Um, we hike a hundred miles as a team once a year. Um, and, and that's, that's, you know, so there's, so there's those, those, those aspects, right. And then you get the right cultural fits in the company and they're going out on their own time. So our best ideas come from that. But I would also say, you know, we're, we're not opposed or, you know, just going to put ourselves in total isolation where we want to know what other people are doing. We want to know what technologies are out there. And we have our own group of, of people that we trust, which is a pretty small list because Brigham, our product designer, he's, he's maybe not the most trust trusting person. So he has a very small people, a group of people that he will, you know, send product to and let them test it out and give feedback as well. So, um, but, you know, we really try to keep everything very close, um, to ourselves and, and real world experiences, you know, we'll look at laboratory testing from, from factories or, or from, um, whatever it is, but then we want to go and prove that ourselves in the field. And so we do a lot of that. And then I'd say the other side of that though, is when you spend that much time outdoors and then you go and you sit down with fabric mills and you sit down with, with, you know, any, any cut and sew facility or, or product develop, uh, you know, manufacturing partner, it, sometimes it can feel as easy as connecting dots when you see a new technology. You're just like, oh my goodness, this is perfect. This is what we've been missing. Yeah. But that has to come from a place of experience, right? So one of our products, one of our best-selling products is our Ventus Active Hoodie. And that piece was one that like we showed up, we looked at some some newer tech that was that was presented to us and we said, holy crap, this is going to be a game changer. And what if we added these few things? And, and it almost felt like to me and the designer here, Brigham, that we we had that piece designed in minutes and then it was just like, you know, testing and improving it and stuff. Um, but it almost felt like you're just connecting dots. Um, and, and that piece has just been absolutely phenomenal. And it really resides in its own category. But that comes in, in part two from having fantastic manufacturing partners that trust us to to bring new things to market at times. 
Oh, that's fun. I love it. I love when it comes together easily like that. And I'm sure that's very infrequent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. There's different products, especially too. Like you get into backpacks and it's just a totally different ball game where you got hundreds of pieces, you know, oh, getting yeah. sewn together. And then the durability aspects, maybe you find recycled material, but that doesn't hold up as well for the, your target audience, what they're going to do with it. Um, I can't imagine yeah. that. Well, speaking of gear, you have quite a few things coming out in 2023. Can we talk about any of this stuff coming up? I will do my best to <laughs> give as much detail as I can, but. Wonderful. Well, I've been very fortunate to have test some stuff here in the last four or five months and I really enjoy it. And how I apply it is uh, in the winter camping and split boarding and hiking over here in Colorado. And then, um, so I'm really excited about some of the new stuff coming up, uh, sleeping pad. It's just. Yeah. So we just released the sleeping pad. That's something that's been in development for quite some time. And really the core focus on that piece was comfort, um, getting quality sleep. If you take a survey, like 80% of people sleep on their side, but then so many of them buy like a two inch thick pad and, and, you know, struggle with it. And so, um, for us, it was just all about comfort and then improving the comfort of our previous pad and then increasing the warmth value from our previous pad as well. And so we put some newer, technology for at least for us it's been out in the market a little bit um with an insulation it's it's an insulation that then is bonded to a non-woven and then there's a metallicized film on the other side of it um so that's our insulation piece in in the, the pad and then we also coated the top fabric with a silver coating a reflective coating as well and so that gives you just a little bit more of an edge for warmth and so the overall piece though is is we, we changed to an eye baffle construction, you know, kind of like a quilted looking construction, okay. which really improved just, just overall comfort and its ability to absorb, you know, discomforts from underneath or just you're laying on it. And then we really increased the, the R value. Um, we didn't actually have our previous pad R value tested. It was such an old, um, design, but, um, you know, at least 10 to 15 degrees warmer in the field than, than that pad. So that piece has been awesome. I've been sleeping on it exclusively for quite some time now. I mean, every trip in the last 12 months and it's been my favorite pad as a guy who, who gets his base weight down to 10 pounds or less. That's one area that I'm all in on the comfort of that pad. I will take a freestanding tent, which I actually prefer now, you know, or cut weight in other categories or use a quilt which I prefer now about nine months out of the year. Um, but I will take a big comfortable pad. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I think it's a crucial thing to have the sleeping cover, especially, um, you're in Utah, I'm in Colorado. It can get pretty cold at night, especially fall winter camping for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just took that pad out on that cross country ski trip, put a Nemo switchback close cell phone pad underneath it. And we were, I think we got down to negative two, negative three degrees and, it did. It did great. Oh, that's phenomenal! Wow, well, that's exciting. Well, I'm actually going to do a back uh, a, a camping trip this weekend with some riders. We're going to do uh, some backcountry skiing and splitboarding at a local area called Bluebird here, which is like a, a ski resort, but no mechanical advantage. It's all human powered. And oh, uh, wow, yeah, it's a really cool resource. So we're gonna, and they do mitigation too for avalanche control and stuff. So it's a good place for beginners to go. But long story longer, it's going to be camping uh, in the snow in the cold. And they provide bacon, which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sold, man. Yeah, bacon I'm in sold. backcountry. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a cool place to shoot a video for your sleeping pad there. Oh, yeah, stuff. for real. Yeah, you're pushing it. Negative temperature, that's no joke. Everything's freezing. All the water bottles are freezing and gets demoralizing if you expose your skin at all. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, we love to go out and do those trips. They're, they're hard, but we make sure to do at least a couple of them a year and and just push the limits on, on the products. You know, we we feel like it's our moral obligation to do that where it's like, Hey, if we're telling you this is a zero degree bag, or if we're telling you this pad is good for this, then we want to be the ones pushing the limits, not our customers. hundred percent. That's some great integrity right there. Um, speaking of backpacks, uh, two backpacks, it looks like, right? Yes. So there are some sneak peeks coming out on that. Um, in fact, a video that'll come out in the next couple of days, you'll be able to see, a new pack. Um, and I think that might be like the first real sneak peek, but it's, you know, obviously you're going to see it's a different fabric. It's a, it's an ultra fabric and 
Um, really this was, this was set on kind of satisfying. We released the shadow light, which has been a phenomenal pack for us, but there's still a lot of through hikers and people that want, you know, to, to reduce some of the things off of it, maybe the upper pockets or the zipper, um, which I always find funny, right? There's a lot of people like on our shadow light, they're like, oh, the zipper is a failure point. We've had exactly zero issues, warranted zippers on our shadow light pack. Um, and it's been something that's used in military packs for years and all sorts of things. But, um, so there's some people like that, that, so we took, a, we took our, what we feel like we do really well is that we make sure that the load carry on a pack is very, is done very well. So there's a lot of packs out there that are frameless. There's a lot of packs out there that use like an 18 inch frame. And, you know, our background is actually in, in being sportsmen, right? So we're, we're, we're taking game out of the field and you yeah. can have hundred to, to 150 pound packs. And so you learn a lot about load carry. And so when me and Brigham get into, you know, ultralight stuff, and, and even if we've got a 10 pound base weight, you've got food. And then in Utah, you can have water carries of, you know, six liters at a time or more. And so you can still get a pack that gets up there close to 30 pounds. And so we just feel like like load carry is incredibly important. So we have tall frames on our packs, 23 inch, 24 inch frames, um, that really transfer that load off your shoulders down to your hips. And so this pack will be really interesting because it gives an incredibly ultra light pack still to still have a phenomenal frame and load carry system inside of it. And then just has some of those newer, sexier materials too in it. I mean, we really held back nothing when it came to the, the costing of this, this, product. Um, I won't tell you what our price will be, but you know, if this was a retail product, if, if any other, you know, retail based company was going to be selling that pack, it'd be a $600 pack. Um, oh, wow. so it's, it's going to be a fun pack to release. So that's, that's pack number one. I'm already intrigued. I am, up, <laughs> I'm in on that one. <laughs> and there's more. Pack, yeah. Yeah. Pack number two is one that we have been testing and people have seen it for quite a few years because, you know, when, when we first decided to develop a fast pack, we went out and, and did a 60 mile fast packing trip as a team and, you know, just got used to what fast packing is. And, and that was really kicked it off. And so that's a documented video on our YouTube channel. Um, but really this pack is interesting for those, for those of you that don't know what fast packing is, fast packing is essentially just trying to cover as many miles as you can at its simplest form. But a lot of times that looks like maybe even jogging downhill, maybe jogging some flats and then just power hiking the uphills. So you're just trying to push the limits of, of speed on trail. And so there's some things that really start to matter with it though, such as again, load carry is the pack bouncing. How does the harness feel? All of those types of things. And, um, we've really just been fine tuning that for like two years now. And we're really excited to finally release this pack because it's, it's harness system is, is, just phenomenal. We don't get any bounce. You don't get any shaking in the pack. Um, and it's, and, and then we, we introduced some new, new fabrics on that too, which I won't touch on just yet, but, um, yeah, just a really, really fun pack. I mean, I train with it a lot. And then when we're going out to do quick, you know, one to two night trips, where we're just doing a, covering a lot of miles that that pack is, is phenomenal for that. Well, that's exciting. Um, we have a lot of, uh, ultra runners and fast packers on our team that be very interested in that. And the, on the first one, we have a lot of bow hunters as well. And so like to your point, you know, best case scenario, you're coming back with additional weight. So I like that you guys take pride in the ability to carry weight. Yeah. It's, it's wild to us. Um, just the amount of packs that are out there that, I mean, they don't even have like a, a load lifter strap on the pack. They'll have a frame and no load lifter strap or, you know, it's just like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't understand. You something. Yeah. You know, I don't quite understand, but yeah, ultra runners. Um, we, so I went and ran my first ultra marathon last year and at the event, we set up a booth the night before when they're doing signups to, to ask people, Hey, like, or have you ever heard of fast packing? Are you interested in fast packing? And we're just taking some survey data and yeah, there's a lot of ultra runners that are already aware of fast packing or that would could easily be swayed to start fast packing because they're so addicted to the running and to getting outdoors. And it's like, wait, I can, I could go this much further. Or I could go through this wilderness area or something like that with a fast pack. And, um, so the, a lot of ultra runners have shown a lot of interest, which is cool. Nice. Well, very intrigued so far. Um, and the windbreaker, you guys are pretty excited on this windbreaker. Yeah. The windbreaker, I mean, it's, it's like in transit to us right now. So it shouldn't be long before it's out. And this piece, 
to define, I guess, what's slightly different about or what really makes it right. A windbreaker is not much to it, right? It's, it's really the fabric, right? The fabric is everything, you know, there's a chest pocket on it and, and you could add features. You can take away features, but it's a pretty minimal design, um, comes in at like four or five ounces, but the fabric itself is, is really what makes it. So it's a Japanese fabric. Um, what's interesting is, is the company that makes it for us, um, our, our, one of our fabric mills, they have, you know, mills in China as well as in Japan and, and, and other places. And even if even the same company trying to make the same fabric, um, in China, they can't replicate like what this mill can do in, in Japan. And so, um, so we switched to this fabric and started testing it and it's just, it's absolutely incredible. It's, um, significantly more breathable than other fabrics we've already been using that have been in production. Um, to the tune of, of it's either 10 or 20 times more breathable than, than these other ones, you know, laboratory testing sure. like numbers. Right. Um, but it's just incredibly breathable, still blocks the wind really, really well. And so for us, you know, where we use a windbreaker is typically high output activity. You're, you're, mm -hmm. you know, cross country skiing, you're, you're running, you're, you know, actively hiking, but it's not necessarily the piece that you're sitting around camp with. And so that breathability factor, being able to block the wind, but still stay breathable, is is really what makes that piece so unique and so um so good in the field so it's been a phenomenal piece really excited to bring that out and that one i mean it, it'll be released in in march so oh cool sign me up for that that sounds great um i've kind of gotten away from wind blockers because it can get clammy but i've noticed a lot of the ones with like the pertex air and such which will have like what 20 or 30 cfm of breathability so yeah a good, well, a good well, amount. yeah exactly so i think this is a 20 cfm great so yeah, block the wind, still but be able to breathe. It makes a huge difference though. Like to your point there, um, as they really can, like we tested, you know, to begin with, we'll typically go out, order some of the ones that are the highest rated and reviewed and we'll, we'll take them back and, and use them and, and go from there. And, um, yeah, like the last thing you want to be doing is just trapping moisture inside of that, that piece. And yeah. a lot of them out there seem to do that. And so, um, with this piece, it's really impressive that it still has such a high level of water resistancy with no coating, um, you oh, know, wow. or like it, it'll have a DWR coating, but like it, like as far as not just how to say that I, anyways, without having to put additional, any additional coatings on there, it, it retains a very high, um, you know, rain pass test. So it's, it's impressive. Cool. Nice weave. Very intriguing stuff so far. Um, let me see what's next. I have notes on, um, carbon fiber poles for the 40th tent. Yep. Those are, those are released now. So if you're not a trekking pole guy, you can, you can add, I think it's about four ounce per pole. So for eight ounces, you can, you can pitch our 40th tents now without trekking poles. Um, so that's something that, you know, there's, there's those that just don't use trekking poles. They're sportsmen, right. That are going out in the field. Maybe they want to keep their trekking poles with them during the daytime. And so it's really nice. And at the same time we released those, we actually brought on some, some new aluminum stakes that are made by Easton for us here, actually in Utah. And we're, I'm adamant about having a quality stake with a freestanding tent. And so these, these have been, I've been using them for two, three years now, three years, and they have just been amazing. Um, I think I've had two bend in like three years, one of them, my wife bent and one of them, I blame someone else still, but, um, <laughs> they've just been, they're super light. They're about the same weight as like a six, uh, a six inch, you know, lightweight aluminum stake, but you get a nine inch stake just gives you that much more ability to get them in the ground. But both of those have been you know, are just really complimentary to a freestanding shelter. And, you know, if you haven't, or if you, sorry, not a freestanding shelter, a, um, trekking pole style shelter, but if, and, and if you haven't used a trekking pole style shelter, I, I, once you start to use them, I feel like it's, it's hard to go back because they just save so much weight and space in your pack. And as long as you understand, you know, pitching them and stuff, I've, I've never had any issues. No, I agree. I, when you guys sent that over to the 40th tent, I was super excited, but I made the mistake of bringing it to, um, I was getting beers with some of the riders and I put them on the table and um, one of my colleagues, Will Rickards, who is a very adamant tarp and trekking pole tent kind of guy, he's way more hardcore than I am, saw that and took it and he's been using it all since <laughs> you guys sent it over. <laughs> he's, he's enjoying the heck out of it, him and his son, Kai, and his dog, Baggins. Um, so you'll have a good video for that pretty, pretty soon. But yeah, That's awesome. It's, yeah, it's they're fun setups, especially um, I think if we got him those poles, it'd be great because he uses his poles during the day, um, you know, Rainier, wherever he's going next. Um, so 
yeah, it's a good idea to have those polls. Well, we better we better get a list together to to see what we need to send you next. But yeah, we can we can definitely get you polls. Or if if he's never going to give it back, we may have to get you a second tent. So <laughs> yeah, I'll get it done quicker than he does. He does like these long term missions, and it's really impressive. I'm like, dude, can it? It's been like three months. Can you just give us something <laughs> give us something? But uh, right, he's he's a hoot. Um, anything else coming up that you want to talk about? Um, let's see. We've got. So our, our altitude sun hoodie, which is what I'm wearing right now, that's going to come out in a short sleeve and a long sleeve, um, you know, without the hood, that'll be a little bit later this year. Um, I know there's, I know there's more that I'm just not thinking of. I mean, we just have a constant list of things we're going through, but I think, I think those are the, the big ones for now. So yeah, that's, that's quite an impressive amount of stuff right there. And then um, when they come out, they'll be on the website. Will there be any kind of like teasers on social media or on YouTube for getting people stoked on them? Yeah. So if you're, I mean, the best way to get like real teasers on stuff is definitely to be just subscribed to our YouTube channel. Um, you'll just see stuff like we won't, we won't comment on it. We won't tell you what it is or anything like that, but you'll just be like, what the heck is this white backpack he's wearing all of a sudden? Like, that's not the shadow light, you know, that's not their pack. And so um, you get teasers in that that way. And then obviously if you're a Live Ultra Light member on our membership or just on our email list, you'll you'll get teasers as well. Um, and and we'll, we'll, we definitely send out more and more of those as we get closer to launch. So that's wonderful. And it's a great YouTube channel too. Um, I'm a subscriber and everybody, everybody should be as well. Um. A couple more questions before I get you back to your day to day. Um, what is like essential in your kit for overnight, just for you? Essential in my kit. I feel like, I mean, maybe we're going for a different direction here, but I mean, like, I don't take much that's not essential <laughs> just for me personally. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, what I typically do is I will get my base weight to 10 pounds and then I'll add in about two pounds of what I would consider a luxury item. So that might be a pound in an Helinox chair. Mm -hmm. That might be, you know, a pair of binoculars or something on a trip that might be, you know, any, anything like that. Right. So that's, that's like my three season kit is that's typically how it works in the winter. You know, I'll be taking more layers and, and things, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, do you want to go in a specific direction with like essential? Well, no, I think that the binoculars is a good twist. Um, I use a Nox, like a monocular. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, and then I have a little snow adapter kit, so I can do like a microscope, so I can study snow too. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll have to get you hooked up with those guys. They make really good stuff, and it's a little bit more compact than the binoculars, and you can still get the range for glassing or whatever, and then get the snow study. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's I've never heard of being able to, you know, use that in, in a, in a microscope type of a sense. I, I just barely actually picked up a monocular, um, cause I've been using some, some smaller lightweight ones, but I'm like, Oh, I don't spend like a lot of time. I think I'd be happy with the monocular. So I am going to try that out, but I'd never heard of being able to, um, slap something on there to, to look at, at close stuff. So that's really interesting. Holy, totally. I'll link you guys up after the, this is over. Yeah. Cool. Company. Yeah. No. Um, well, the next question I had kind of online with this, uh, do you take the kids camping? Yeah, yes, I do. In fact, um, my wife was just text, uh, messaging me this morning asking if I was still going to take them camping this weekend because it's scheduled to snow like from now until the weekend. Um, but yeah, I, I love to take the kids out. And, you know, really anytime I go out there with them, it's just how do I make this the best possible experience for them so that they learn to love this stuff, right? And mm -hmm. it's, I think the first couple of times, you know, because my kids are young, I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old and but the first times I was taken out, I was, I was real nervous that they'd, you know, get bored, they'd get cold, they'd get, you know, these different things. And, but really they, they just thrive, you know, kids love being outdoors when, when there's just, you know, there's just nothing around. And, you know, my boy, I mean, you start a fire and uh, he won't go anywhere. He'll, he'll just sit there and feed that fire all night, you know, and, but it's, it's a great time, but yeah, it's, it's been fun too, just cause what I love to do is I mean, we, we've always, you know, we do, I do have a trailer and we'll camp in that and, and we'll sometimes car camp, but, um, it's a lot of fun to, to backpack with them as well. And, um, that's really where it gets special in terms of like, you know, dad time and, and, um, but yeah, that's, I think that's also just another one of those solid reasons to 
be packing ultralight, right? Because mm-hmm. I can pack in the gear for him. I can pack in the gear for me. And he literally, every, the last two years that I've taken him, um, at least my boy, that is, he will carry just a school backpack and I'll let him pick out a candy from the store that's in his backpack. And so the only thing he carried last year was a bag of high chews and a water bottle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, it empowered him. It worked. That's great. Oh, yeah, that's really exciting. I, I, unlike you, I, I do a lot of camping with uh, other friends and they bring their kids uh, ages two through 10 and they, they, just, they naturally gravitate to the outdoors and they love it. It's so beautiful to see. Um, are there any kind of tips or like gear that you recommend to, to get kids more comfortable or first time parents going out with their kids? Yeah. I mean, to me, it's just keeping them warm and keeping them fed is like the two, the two biggest things. Um, so what all the, the areas where I'll add weight, right. Cause like I say, I'll usually peel back my, my base weight as much as I can. And then I'll start adding weight. So I'll add weight for things like, um, like a quality fleece onesie, right. Or something for them to sleep in. That's just like, it doesn't really compress that well or whatever, but, but it's just, a really good base layer for them to sleep in. Um, so that's, there's, there's that aspect of it. Um, I'll always make sure they have, they have just good layers. Um, and usually that means like not as nice as of layers, like their, their clothes takes up as much space as my clothes, even though they're a fraction of my size, because it's, you know, it's harder to get kids really high end stuff when they're growing so fast, but you know, so I'll, I'll usually take in more weight and bulk there. And then, you know, just, just going back to like the, the food aspect, um, really, you know, bringing along quality food. So my, my boy loves the, the peak refuel meals. And I mean, he looks forward to those a lot. And then I'll always bring him, I'll let him pick out different candy and stuff like that for him to, to eat. And, you know, I think if you take on those two things, they do well, you know, sometimes, and sadly, like this is the world we live in where it's like, oh, you know, like, let's, you know, let's, let's watch something on your phone, dad. Let's watch something. And it's like, no, no, that's, that's <laughs> not here. That's not what this is about. Yeah. Let's go throw rocks in the lake. And, you know, they might push back at first, but um, I'm always amazed at how quickly that, that can fade out of their mind and, and come right back into just being present in nature. And so to me, there's, there's way more anxieties than needs to be there. Um, yeah. you know, there's a few bases to cover, but, but it's not as, as scary as I think, um, people realize, uh, you know, like this weekend, it's going to be me solo with a three-year-old and a six-year-old out there and, and we'll be fine. You know, we'll have a good time. And, but I think, I think other people see that and think that that's insane. And it's just, it's, it's, it's not as hard, I think, as people, um, you know, give it credit at times and it's, it's totally doable. And, and, um, I think kids adapt, like they realize that you're one person and you're trying to, to, to do everything and to take care of everyone. And, and, um, they're, you know, they're where their surroundings and, and like they, it doesn't have to be perfect. You know what I mean? That's very encouraging, uh, on a lot of levels. And I think that the, the patience to let that, uh, digital desire dissipate is really awesome. Cause I have watched a lot of parents like, okay, fine. Here's, here's Encanto on the iPad. They're quiet for an yeah. hour or two, as opposed to just yeah. weathering the storm, so to speak. And then letting them immerse back in nature. So I think it's very encouraging. And also that you're doing it solo, the two kiddos, three and six, that's incredible. I've, I've watched my friends do that. And I, I, I hope more people see that and get inspired by that and see it's totally doable. And to your point, doesn't have to be perfect. Not all mapped out and everything, just taking care of the basics and having fun with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally possible if, if, you know, you're willing to take it on. Yeah. Oh, I love it. We've covered a, a lot of fun stuff here, Tayson. Uh, of course, the gear, which is important. We've covered that. But the the very helpful, tangible stuff that can affect everybody who's getting out camping. Um, is there anything else you'd like to, to add to the conversation here? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I really enjoy what you do. You review so much gear and, you know, you touch so many different companies out there, right? Like you're dealing with so, I mean, I, you're, per, you're producing more content than I feel like I've ever seen, um, just be produced in, in general. So it's, it's really, really amazing, but yeah, I mean, just, just maybe one thing to leave us off with just going back to, to outdoor vitals, you know, I think our, our goal definitely is, is still going to be to grow, but it's, it's not growth. Um, it's never growth over anything else, meaning, mm-hmm. 
meaning we do have that opportunity to to set our sights on what we look like in 10 years and focus on that right i i am you know the sole owner me and my wife and you know we we can make those kind of decisions without being swayed to hey we need to boost revenue to this or we need to you know be more aggressive over here we need we need got to boost profits or we got to we got to bolster it up so that we can sell the the company every couple of years right like that's most people don't realize that investment companies are flipping their company every three to five years. And so you'll see a company get bolstered up and they'll start firing people, they'll cut costs and then they'll sell it. And then, you know, and then it's a new management It's and it's a different thing. And so, um, you know, I think that, that, that is, it, it's kind of sad to me to see that that's the day and age that we're in of, of just this constant flipping. And I had, I had a friend, you know, this is top of mind this week. Cause I had a friend who asked me, a similar question on this. And I was thinking, okay, I was trying to answer this back. And I tried to find another private company in our space. And I was like, oh yeah, these guys. And I Google them like, oh no, they've taken money. And I Googled these guys and oh no, they've taken money. And and I literally couldn't find one. And so the only one that I really can, that I look up to personally, and not that like we have the same values or anything like that, but, but what they've been able to do is, is Patagonia. And you look at what Patagonia has been able to do over their 40 plus years, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it, and it, it's the benchmark to us, right? Because they can keep the focus on what they want to keep it on. And for them, it's saving the planet, right? And they've done more good than any company ever has in terms of what their goals were and their purpose was. And so really that's, that's our hope. It's not that we go take money and then we just like quadruple our advertising. And so we're like forcing our product on people's throats. It's no, we want to make the best performing products that speak for themselves. You know, we want to create content, but really it's all about just getting people outside and getting them connected with the vital outdoors. And, um, I don't know. I just, I just would encourage people to to think about some of those aspects when they're making purchases. Cause I think it's you, your, your dollars are what you're voting with. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for, for what we have the opportunity to become over, over the next decades of time, because, you know, thankfully for us, our values don't need to change. And if they, if we ever got to a point where it felt like they did, then we'd, we'd pull back. You know what I mean? We, we would, we'd, we, we, we have stop gates and actually keep us from growing too fast, even at this point. So we're willing to, to do that in, in, na- in the name of, of long-term. So it's an interesting conversation. It's an interesting thing that I don't think a lot of people think about, but, um, the landscape has changed and, and, and it's something that people should keep top of mind. I love it. And I couldn't agree more about Patagonia um, doing what they say they want to do, doing it right and leading the way for people like us, like you to, to uh, enjoy and find inspiration from. Uh, so that's, that's a good shout out to them, but uh, I love what you guys are doing and the products, the the clothing, the gear that you're creating, it's so functional and it's so well-made and the materials I, are great. I know because I study other companies and I see the Torre here and I see the things over here. I'm like, that's legit stuff. And the price point, um, very fair. Um, there'll be a video up here later this week comparing some down jackets. And again, your, uh, your it's come out to the top. Uh, it's just hard to beat, you know? So you're doing really good things over there and I, I keep up the good work for sure. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it and I've appreciated the the reviews and things you guys have, have put out. And, you know, it speaks a lot to like what you're picking up on and what, uh, you know, it's always fun to send out a product and then you see like what people review it back on and, and it tells you a lot about them and like what they pick up on. And and I feel like you, you've you really grasped like what the, what the Nova jacket line is and not a lot of people catch up on those nuances. And so... I think that speaks volumes, just the amount of product you put your hands on, the amount of time you spend outside and and the quality of, of the stuff you're putting out. That means a lot, man. Thank you, Tayson. <laughs> uh, that made my day. Makes it all <laughs> worthwhile, you know, all the hard work behind the scenes. Well, um, totally. I hope to do this more often with you. There's a lot to share. I know we're just kind of riffing and having a good time, even before we push record. Uh, there's so much to cover, uh, a lot of good things in the future. And of course, I'll put links to the Outdoor Vitals YouTube channel, as well as the podcast that Tayson hosts. And um, I'll put links to the reviews we've currently done and things we will do in the future so people, our audience, can learn more about these products and see how we use them and what we think about them, not just myself, but other members on our team, that men and women of our different backgrounds. So um, a lot to look forward to. Uh, Tayson, thank you for your time. Very much for being on the Gearman Podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Sean. My pleasure. To all you out there, stay tuned for another Gearman Podcast. Uh, until next time, 
Take care.